Good evening, everyone. Thank you so very much for joining us here tonight. You're in for a real treat. We are here tonight to celebrate the virtual launch of The Paris Apartment by Kelly Bowen, already a number one bestseller here at the store, even before the event itself. Thank you all so very much for joining us here tonight. My name is John Taves, and I'm broadcasting tonight live from McNally Robinson Booksellers in Winnipeg, Manitoba, a Treaty One territory, the traditional territory of the Anishinaabeg, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. I'd like to thank Forever and Hachette Books Canada for helping to pull this evening together, and of course, for publishing the book that we are here to celebrate. Uh, just to get, get a few housekeeping notes out of the way, um, as soon as I'm finished speaking, I'll be introducing the host for this evening, who will then introduce the author. They'll have a chat um, for a little while, uh, following which we'll open the floor to questions from you folks out there. And I'm sure this book is so rich in history and story, and the conversation proves to touch on any number of topics. So I'm sure you'll all have a large number of questions by the time the Q&A rolls around. As questions occur to you, please feel free to enter them into the Q&A box that you'll find just at the bottom of your screen. Don't worry, you won't interrupt the flow of the evening at all by putting a question there, and that way we'll ensure they're in a very easy spot for your host to find when it comes time to put your questions to the author. So without further ado, Erica Roebuck, your host, is the national best-selling author of Hemingway's Girl, Call Me Zelda, Fallen Beauty, The House of Hawthorne, and Receive Me Falling. She's a contributor to the anthology Grand Central, post-war stories of love and reunion, and to the Writer's Digest essay collection, Author in Progress. She writes satire, hashtag hockey strong, as E. Roebuck. Her latest novel, The Invisible Woman, oh, The Invisible Woman, is about real life superwoman of World War II, OSS, SOE agent, Virginia Hall, and is also proof positive as to why I should not juggle two titles simultaneously while introducing someone. In 2014, Roebuck was named Annapolis's Author of the Year, and she resides there with her husband, three sons, and a spunky miniature schnauzer. Please join me in virtually welcoming Erica Roebuck. Thank you. That was a great, I think you did a great job with that introduction, John. Um, and I've uh, threatened the husband, three sons, and spunky miniature schnauzer with their lives for the next hour because I have been dying to talk. To Kelly. After I read The Paris Apartment, um, I was just, when I got an opportunity to host this, I was beside myself with joy, and mostly I'm just going to be fangirling over her. Um, but to introduce Kelly, Kelly is a Rita award-winning author, and she grew up in Manitoba. She attended the University of Manitoba and earned a Master of Science degree in veterinary physiology and endocrinology. But it was Kelly's infatuation with history and a weakness for a good love story that led her down the path of historical romance. When she is not writing, she seizes every opportunity to explore ruins and battlefields. Currently, Kelly lives in Winnipeg with her husband and two boys. So let us welcome Kelly. Thank you very much. Hello. Kelly, we are kindred spirits. You had me at battlefields, actually. <laughs> <laughs> How do you feel about graveyards? I love them. I spend a lot of time in them, uh, looking at names and birth dates and uh, imagining the stories behind each of those lives. There you go. I went on a Stephen King tour once and he said he gets all of his names from graveyards. So I think we must be in good company. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I want to, before I get into introducing the book, I want to say our connection is through our literary agent, uh, Kevin Lyon, and she had approached me um, many, many months ago and asked if I'd be willing to read while I was in the middle of deadline. And I gave her the usual, I don't think I can do it. Um, and within two nights, I had finished the Paris apartment and I was just completely, completely blown away by it. What has this week been like for you? Uh, it's been uh, very busy in absolutely the best way. Uh, you yourself would know with your book coming out in February. Uh, it's so exciting and humbling to have so many people excited about your book. And it's, it, there's nothing better. There's nothing better. Well, it's well deserved. Um, I'm going to read a short synopsis of The Paris Apartment. And then I'm going to jump into my questions. And after that, we will open it up to the audience. If there's something I don't hit, please feel free to put it in the Q&A box and we'll try to get to everyone. 
Um, the synopsis begins 2017 in London when Aurelia Leclerc inherits an opulent Paris apartment. She is shocked to discover her grandmother's hidden secrets, including a treasure trove of famous art and couture gowns. One obscure painting leaves her to Gabriel Seymour, a highly respected art restorer with his own mysterious past. Together, they attempt to uncover the truths concealed within the apartment's walls. In Paris, 1942, the Germans may occupy the city of lights, but glamorous Estelle Allard flourishes in a world separate from the hardships of war. Yet when the Nazis come for her friends, Estelle doesn't hesitate to help those she holds dear, no matter the cost. As she works against the forces intent on destroying her loved ones, she can't know her actions will have ramifications for generations to come. Set 75 years apart against a perilous and a prosperous Paris, both Estelle and Leah must unearth hidden courage as they navigate the dangers of a cha changing world, altering history and their families' futures forever. So without further ado, please, where did you get the first glimmers of this story? Where did you get your idea to write this? Uh, so the original idea uh, came from my own family's uh, history. Uh, both my grandfathers served in World War II and uh, my grandfather I was closest with had a massive collection of books, uh, which was funny because he never spoke of the war, but he had a huge collection of books. Uh, he also taught me everything he knew about radios. Um, so by the time I was in grade four, five, six, I could put together circuit boards. I could fix uh, radio. Um, he would quiz me on the correct transistor and resistor and capacitor and what order they go in. Um, so I've always been really fascinated um, with this conflict. And uh, then over the years, um, I read about the girl at Horde being discovered, which was an art uh, hoard discovered uh, in Munich. I read about uh, the De Florian apartment, which was discovered in Paris, which yeah. was shut up for decades and dec decades and discovered with, um, with a Boldini painting uh, left inside. Uh, so that kind of just got me thinking, uh, and that was kind of the springboard for the story. Well, you captured that so beautifully, even as the story opens, as the apartment door opens, you just get such a sense of the past and it's, you know, someone has just left the room and that's exactly how it stayed for all these years. Um, and it just is immediately transportive. So that's, uh, that's really cool to hear about the radio and, and your grandfather too, that's amazing. Um, so previously you had written historical romance set in Regency England, which is also very popular. Uh, the Paris apartment takes place in France during World War II and the modern day. How did your research and writing processes differ? Uh it probably didn't differ too much. Um, the research element was still the same. Uh, you want to make sure you get the historical details right. I do take some fictional liberties, of course. Uh, so the research part, which is my favorite part of writing, <laughs> you get to learn about history. Uh, and then uh, what was new for me uh, compared to historical romance uh, was the ability to write in a contemporary setting. Oh. So. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness, we could just have a phone conversation and a message didn't take two months to get somewhere. So that was kind of exciting um, to write in both the contemporary and historical setting. Uh, and also a challenge because that was new for me. And mm -hmm. I didn't want to be repetitive in the storytelling. So it was a bit of a, a bit of a learning curve and how to mesh the two. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you did it beautifully and you have many different uh, character points of view and it just flows very naturally from one to the next. So if readers haven't picked that up yet, they're going to be, uh, they're not going to be intimidated, even with all the time periods and the people, it's seamless. Um, do you prefer one over the other, having written romance, historical fiction, or is that like asking, you know, who's your favorite child? That is like asking who's your favorite child. <laughs> I suppose it depends on the day. <laughs> <laughs> but right. um, <laughs> but no, I don't think I have a preference. Um, writing romance, uh, the focus is on the romantic relationship between the hero and the heroine or whatever your characters are. Um, in, uh, in, in this historical fiction, the emphasis is still on relationships, um, but in a slightly different slightly different angle. Uh, so this one was the friendship between two women mm -hmm. and a friendship um, between the two contemporary uh, characters that does sort of blossom into more of a romance. Yeah, 
Yeah, all that, all that's there. And it's really, um, it's really fun. And you feel the emotional depth of the friendships and the love relationships, but also of the generations. I was so taken by how, you know, the young woman thinks one thing about her grandmother and learns another and just kind of going through that with her, what that would have felt like um, that was done really powerfully. And speaking of emotions, there are some very emotional scenes in the Paris apartment. So do you have to be in a certain mindset to write those, you know, there's the, there's action scenes, there's scenes of, um, you know, I think of, of the Velvey roundup, uh, you know, there's just different emotional beats in this book that are so strong. How do you uh, prepare for those? Uh, the action scenes I find easier. I never like to use the word easy to write, easier yeah. to write, um, mm -hmm. because it's action and it's one thing after another. And, and it's kind of plays like a movie inside your head, uh, mm -hmm. when I'm writing at least, um, when you write the more emotional scenes, uh, those, I, I kind of have to sit with them for a while. They kind of have to stew and I'll write them and I'll go back probably like a dozen times and just add and take away and polish and play with them a little bit in terms of what I want the message to be coming out of that emotional scene and how that emotional scene furthers the story. Yeah. Yeah. Not just emotion for emotion's sake, but for character and um, and for that development. Yeah, there's some, uh, some very powerful scenes in here. When you are in the middle of writing a novel, are you able to read fiction or do you prefer to live exclusively in your own story? Uh, nope, uh, when I read, um, well, when I'm writing, I try not to read similar, uh, mm -hmm. similar a uh, time period. So if I'm writing this book, I probably try not to read so much in the same time period um, in that I just want to, keep my ideas separate, perhaps. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if that's a very good explanation. Um, but I do tend to read, if I'm writing historical, I tend to read a lot of contemporary or a lot of fantasy or a lot of science fiction. Mm -hmm. um, there's inspiration to be had in everywhere. And it's just fun little nuggets that you find in all sorts of genres and, uh, and, uh, and books. Yeah, good, good reading is good reading. Um, that being said, can you recommend any recent favorites to us? Uh, in this genre, your book, um, I, like I, I was saying, to, <laughs> oh, <laughs> no, I was no, you did not have to say that because I, I brought this anyways. Here. No. <laughs> I said to Erica earlier, I said I like one more chaptered myself until like four o'clock oh. in the morning on this one. So uh, if you're going to start it, um, I hope you don't have to work the next morning. I'm just saying. Oh, <laughs> um, I wrote, I read, I just finished um, Kate Quinn's The Rose Code. And oh, again, yes, that's fabulous. A Yes, Bletchley Park, fabulous story about three friends, friendship between three women. I loved that. I loved the friendship part of that. Um, and Julia Kelly's, I just wrote, uh, read Light Over London of hers, um, which is about the Gunner Girls. So if you want to know anything about the anti-aircraft uh, girls that protected England shores, that's a really good one to read too. Oh, those sound like great recommendations. I haven't read the other two yet. Um, how about Bletchley Park? Going back to that, that features in your novel. Where, where did you discover what was going on there? How did you research it? Uh, I stumbled across that in um, the books uh, when I started researching um, the women. Um, so the women operatives of the special operations executive were the first women on the Western Front to be thrown into a combat role. And once you start reading about those, um, obviously Bletchley Park plays a huge role in that. Um, they're wonderful. They, they answer all of my questions <laughs> and they were able to point me um, towards a historian, uh, David Kenyon, who was able to tell me a little bit more about the Lorenz uh, machine um, because there's not a lot to be found about the Lorenz. The Enigma is very popular. There's movies, there's books. Um, Alan Turing is very, uh, kind of everyone sort of knows him, um, but the Lorenz and Tommy Flowers and Bill Tut and the Colossus, a um, little less known. Uh, and they were, they were wonderful there. They were able to help me a lot. Yeah, and that's, there were some excellent cameos in those sections where we get a little bit of Vera Atkins, a little bit of Buckmaster. So um, it was great, great fun to see the real historical figures come into the story. Um, how do you pick which, what you're going to make fiction and then what you're going to stick true to history? You know, did you ever think of maybe using a real spy or did you want to stay away from that? I think for this book, um, I wanted to stay away from using a real person, although I did certainly was inspired by um, the memoirs of the real people. And I 
used their ex real life experiences as, as inspiration for sure. Um, because the, I'm trying not to give too away, too much away of the plot here, uh, because uh, the plot that surrounded the Ritz and the Lorenz machine um, was fictional. Um, there was no evidence that uh, anything like that ever existed. I wanted to use fictional characters as well at the same time. Mm -hmm. I see. Uh, well, it's very, all very plausible in the framework, but yeah, there's only so much you can say without giving away all the juicy little tidbits. Um, so um, let me head back to my questions here. What was most surprising to you about the choices your, your women characters made? Because they were in some you know, horrible situations, no win situations. Was there anything that surprised you in the writing that you didn't necessarily plan on that arose? Um, there's always surprises that, that kind of arise as you write your characters. Um, I think for sure um, the character of Estelle uh who has lived in who has been living one way uh and she gets put into an impossible situation and she kind of is takes a departure from maybe what's expected of her mm -hmm. uh and she kind of sticks to her guns and does what she believes is right um for sophie uh she um, very much like Virginia Hall in your novel gets told over and over again what she shouldn't do and what she can't do. And um, she goes ahead and does more mm -hmm. uh, simply because she's going to follow her own convictions. So yeah, I think for, for me, the biggest surprise probably came with Estelle and the lengths that she was willing to go to. Okay. Okay. I won't say why, but I know what you're saying. Well, and I have to ask you a writing question. So are you a plotter or are you a pantser? Are you a combination of both? Probably a combination of both. I do like to have my framework uh, set out and I do like to clearly define uh, the character's internal arc. What, what kind of the journey that they're going to go through and the resolution that they're gonna find at the end, mm -hmm. uh, how they get there in terms of the external conflict is, is a little bit more of a pantser type. Uh, I have some good ideas. I have some scenes in my head, but the, the parts in between, Definitely more of a pantser role. Okay, good. I apologize. I have a house phone. I think I'm the last person in existence that has a house phone and it's- I have one. <laughs> All right, well, back to our questions. Um, you, now, this is fascinating. You went to university to study veterinary physiology. Am I saying this correctly? Correct. It sounds very different from writing novels. Um, <laughs> what, what spurred the career shift? <laughs> uh, so I did my master's degree. I worked for years as a research scientist. Uh, I was in the barns working with the animals. Absolutely loved my job. Um, I left that job when I had my first uh, son okay. and uh, he was a wonderful sleeper. Uh, so I had a lot of extra time on my hands uh, and I started writing as just a way to stay, keep my mind busy, stay creative. Mm -hmm. And um, I wrote five novels. And, and the fifth one, um, the fifth one turned out not to be so terrible. My, my agent, my agent sold it. <laughs> we have a couple in the drawer as we all do. Yes. It's all not, it's not, not wasted. It's just working the muscle. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But it is painful when they're in the drawer like that. Um, so are you working, can you give us a clue as to what you're working on next? Are you going to be doing more romance, more historical fiction, anything? Uh, I do, I just uh, signed a contract for another historical fiction. Um, this will be also a World War II set one, um, similar to the Paris apartment, um, but it is gonna start in the Netherlands. And, uh, and it's going, the focus will be on um, some of the resistance, members of the resistance in the Netherlands uh, that fought, as well as the Jedburgh teams that were sent into uh, both France and the Netherlands ahead of uh, Operation Overlord and Market Garden. Okay, that sounds that sounds like great high stakes, high interest. I mean, what do you think this interest in World War II is never ending? I, I can't read enough about it. Um, I, I don't know if you feel the same. What do you think that is? What do you think draws readers to this over and over again? Oh, it's funny because I get the same question a lot about why is Regency romance so popular mm -hmm. and uh, I think it's the time period and everything that's going on so people say well there's a lot of World War II books well I'll say well there's a lot of World War II stories that need to be told mm -hmm. and 
I kind of find now as more and more documents become declassified, mm-hmm. um, more and more memoirs are kind of out there uh, being written. Uh, the inspiration is there's so much. There are so many stories that have not been told, particularly uh, stories of women. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, I see, actually, I'm going to look at the chat right now. I see some of you have added some questions and the first one has already been answered, but I'm going to pivot to the second from PJ, Austin Dunmore. Which of the three female lead characters did you most closely identify with? What qualities do you share? Um, I've been asked this question before and I think I probably most identified with the character of Sophie. Um, she, again, I don't want to do too many spoilers. She was certainly, um, very talented. Uh, she wanted to break into a male dominated field and working in agriculture. Um, certainly not to the extent that Sophie would have dealt with, but certainly I got some really weird questions (laughs) and some very strange assumptions that were thrown my way. I'd open the barn door a couple of times and say, I, I need to talk to Kelly, the barn manager. Yeah, I'm Kelly. No, the barn manager, I need to talk. Yeah, that would be me. (laughs) So I kind of, I kind of identified it a little bit with that, uh, with the, with the couldn't, wouldn't, shouldn't sort of uh, aspect to, to that. So she would probably be the character that I most identified with. Oh, she's great. That's good to hear. Um, This is a great question from Christine Mott. Do you have input on your book covers? Your cover is stunning. It's absolutely stunning. This is a gorgeous cover. Um, they'll ask me um, a little bit to describe the heroines, like the, the physical description, um, but the art department at Forever um, does just a fabulous job. They've done a fabulous job in all of my book covers and this one, they outdid themselves. It was gorgeous. I actually, I changed the color of the dress in my story. I changed the color of the walls in my story because it was just a beautiful piece of art. Oh, that's great. So that kind of, went, when you went back through copy edits, you are able to make some little tweaks to, to match. Absolutely. Oh, that's great. It's so beautiful. I get a lot of times people say, why is this woman always facing the opposite direction on your covers? And it, you know, it's definitely a hallmark of the genre where you have the, the woman sort of the back view. I, I find it so I can put whatever face I want on her, but. Um, Absolutely. Any other thoughts on the, on the woman, the back to the camera kind or the side <laughs> profile? <laughs> No, the exact same with you. Uh, a lot of the characters, I've, I've heard a lot of readers say they like to imagine um, what she looks like. They, they want to imagine what the hero or the heroine in whatever book they're reading looks like. Okay, I agree. All right, next question from Yolande. I, my glasses aren't on, I'm sorry, cards. <laughs> Did you wonder if your audience would follow you from historical romance? Do you expect your readers to transition? I, I think so. Um, Certainly some of them. I find that the historical romance um, reader community are voracious readers in quite a few, across a number of genres. Mm -hmm. So I hope that some of them were were willing to follow me uh, outside of a classic romance novel, and I hope they like it. Um, And then I hope um, I was able to perhaps uh, find new readers, uh, broaden, broaden a readership. Yeah, and then you have a nice backlist for people to go back and forth. I know I, I mostly read historical fiction, but when I love a book, as I did the Paris Department, then I immediately go to the backlist and see what else I can get, whatever they've written. So, so I'm sure you'll have lots of new and old. Um, PJ also asked, do you plan to write more books in the historical fiction genre, which we know the next one will be? Um, and are there other eras outside of World War II you might like to explore? Um, World War One also. Uh, that also very, has very much interested me for a long time, um, specifically the way the war was fought, the trench warfare, the introduction of chemical agents. Um, I find that quite interesting and I would love to explore that a little bit more. Have you seen the film, was it 1917? Is that the film? I did, yes. Wow, I was so moved by that. That was so fascinating. Yep. Yeah, world, that was World War One, and that trench warfare, they really took you down in the trench for that. It really did, yeah. For Kelly, what was the most challenging and most inspiring aspect in writing this book? Most challenging, most inspiring. Uh, most inspiring was absolutely the women. Um, in this book, in all my books, um, the heroines are always inspired by real life people, real life women, uh, typically women who did what they were told they shouldn't. Um, 
Uh, so inspiring is always the uh, real life women that I, that I base my characters on. Uh, the difficult part, um, I think that would be more of a technical, I, I loved writing this story. Um, it, it certainly wasn't always easy and lots of times um, you were banging her head on the desk a few times, but uh, probably the technical issue of, of taking readers into the past and into the present and then back into the past, back into the present without jarring them right out of the story. I, I really wanted to make sure that it flowed, that it, the story made sense being told in two narratives. Okay, well, you put in, it, it flowed beautifully. I was actually watching to see what you did and I, I still don't exactly understand that it was just so seamless, but I think your characters are so well-developed, I can easily see them. As soon as they came up and I saw the name, I knew, you know, I could picture them. So, so that was good. Um, how do you sustain your writing and what do you do to take a break from your book's world and characters? Uh, I try to treat um, my writing as, as a, like a job. Um, I, I don't write every day. Um, I do take weekends off. I have two very busy boys. I coach. Uh, I do other things outside. Um, I coach? read. I Sorry? What do you coach? I coach volleyball. Oh, great. Yeah. Yeah. I, I attended university on a volleyball scholarship. So uh, now I get to give back to the sport that gave me so many opportunities. So I love it. Absolutely adore it. Um, yeah. So I do try to step back from time to time. I find stepping back uh, really, really, really helps, uh, especially if you've come to a spot where you're not entirely sure uh, where it's gonna go from there. Okay. And then the last piece of this, this was from an anonymous attendee, is what did you learn about yourself through the writing and publication of this book? Oh, good, that's a, that's a good question. What did I learn? Um, this book was probably when I started this book, I was probably a little intimidated. Um, this was the first time I was writing in dual narratives. I had four points of view that I, I really wanted to write in because uh, I thought it was important to have to have those four points to tell the story. Uh, so I think I learned that just keeping to the fundamentals in terms of making sure my characters had those clearly defined conflicts and clearly defined resolutions. Um, that it's it's possible that sounds a little cliched but yeah. but taking on a, a bigger project like that it just uh yeah I, I i i figured out i could do it so do you see that the structure going into your next historical novel uh present and a past component or what do you i think so yeah i do have in my synopsis i do have a present and a past um i like the idea of having that mystery uh, in the present um, for, for the characters to kind of um, discover and also uh, for them to be able to learn from the past, the choices that the characters make in the past and how they influence um, choices that get made in the, in the present, like generations later. Yeah, and those connections, that's great. Um, how do you think that your scientific background, this is from Megan, by the way, background, especially your work with animals affects or influences your writing? Ah, good question. Um, certainly uh, for my Regency books, <laughs> I can tell you a lot about horses. <laughs> I owned horses for a lot of times. I drove horses. I used to take people on for a lot on horseback riding lessons. Um, so that I suppose is helpful. Mm -hmm. um, working in the agriculture industry, I found the industry to be, it's a can-do industry. So uh, when the boiler blows up on you at like four o'clock on Friday evening, no one's looking around and pointing fingers. Everyone's looking around going, how are we gonna fix this? And uh -huh. I think that kind of attitude uh, working in that sort of industry um, really helps in writing. Well, really in any, in any sort of work in that instead of looking around for faults, you're looking around for solutions. Ooh, I love that. Very positive. Um, from Michelle Taylor, any challenges in writing a book from Winnipeg as compared to a larger urban center? I uh, don't think so. You know what's really great about Winnipeg is that it's freaking cold for a long time. And I'm not really inspired to go outside when it's minus 52. So I'm quite happy to sit, Wait, to sit downstairs. Real, is that a real temperature in Winnipeg? It's a real temperature with the wind chill. It, it might only be like minus 35, 36, oh. but with the wind chill, it's just like, it can get miserable. Um, I think if I lived in Hawaii or something, sitting on a, I, with, yeah. I, I don't think I could get anything done. 
That is just absolutely fascinating to me. Like from a human study, I, if I'm even the teensiest bit cold, I'm miserable. If it's, if it is colder than 70 degrees, I'm freezing. Like <laughs> I live almost in the South of the United States. Uh, Maryland is a, is a soupy, humid, swampy place. And we do have winter, but I mean, if, for us to say we have winter compared to that is just silly. Um, but yeah, wow, that's fascinating. <laughs> um, where did you find the research for the art pieces? Ooh, and the couture clothing. Oh, uh, that um, the art pieces I used a lot of um, art books. Um, I uh, last time I was in New York, I dragged my poor sister-in-law um, to the Met, and I dragged her through all of the galleries. Yeah. Uh, and I was also able to visit the Frick collection while I was there. And I I'm that person, um, yes. the Louvre. My poor husband. Um, <laughs> I will drag anyone that wants to that dares come with me to a museum. So um, I love art. I love art history. Um, so I've been fortunate enough to see quite a bit of it actually in real life. And then anything that I couldn't, um, there is a lot of information, certainly on the internet and in books uh, that could fill in any holes. So that right. was, that was a really fun piece of research for me. Oh yeah. It was so, so beautiful and luscious. That's the stuff that adds so much sensory detail. So I feel like this has to be a movie. So do you have any actors and actresses in mind for some of your mm -hmm. main characters? Have you cast the movie yet? Uh, when I cast my movie, when, when Hollywood comes calling, um, I, I always imagined kind of um, Estelle uh, having maybe like a Blake Lively kind of um, very glamorous, very charming, very uh, th that kind of vibe. And then Sophie, um, it's funny, I always, I picture her in my head, um, uh, uh, Rega Ragnars. Um, she plays Gunhild in the show Vikings, in the series Vikings. Okay, and yeah. uh, she's very, sh she's exactly how I imagine Sophie would be. Very confident, very strong, very determined. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's great. How about Gabriel? I'm not sure. That would be a tough one. We'll have to come uh, yeah, I, I think readers could pick could pick that one. <laughs> okay, you can make Gabriel whoever you'd like him to be. Yeah. And Janet is is calling you out. Kelly won't share this, but she is an incredible artist too. I How do you enjoy you art. Want to exhibit your work. Tell us about this. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I love art. I took art in high school, but I didn't go any further with that. But yes, I do. I do still like to paint. Um, I am not an artist like the artists that hang in the Met, but <laughs> it's a fun hobby and uh, it's a great way to also take a break from, from writing as well. Uh, you can um, take a walk or paint a, painting and stew about your characters and what they're doing. Well, that kind of is a segue into the next question that says, do you have a practice that you do when you finish writing a book um, for a sense of completion and separation? Um, not so much. Um, I found, especially writing, um, starting in writing romance uh, and then writing this is, there's never really an end. Uh, typically, uh, you may be writing one book and copy editing another one and promoting a third book at the same time. Oh, wow. So uh, you do just try to um, separate them a little bit. Uh, I do, I can't write two books at one time. So if I do need to copy edit one when I'm writing another one, I will step away from the one I'm writing and get the copy edits done. I can't work simultaneously on that. So uh, once one is finished, um, I might take a little bit of a break, but I'm already thinking of new ideas because for sure you've stumbled upon a nugget somewhere in your last research. And that next book is like begging to be written. <laughs> Exactly. One thing, we get to the next, we get to the next. So on and on you go. Sometimes a little bit too much. Sometimes. <laughs> All right. I'm going to see if you have any more questions, please answer, um, put them in the Q&A. And I'm going to do kind of a lightning round. These are just silly, absolutely silly questions. You know, eight, like fire it off first thing that comes to your mind. Are you ready? Okay. Coffee or tea? Tea. Chocolate cake or cheesecake? Uh, chocolate cake. Classic or contemporary movies? Classic. You can travel anywhere tomorrow. Where are you going? I'm going to Italy. Oh, me too. Yeah, oh, fantastic. <laughs> you know, cocktail, if you consume cocktails. Um, probably just a beer. How Canadian is that? Oh, that's terrible. <laughs> no, that's 
Favorite vacation you've ever been on? Um, I lived and worked for a year in Australia. That was fantastic. It was like a vacation. That's a beautiful country. Right. That wasn't a really quick answer. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's good. What's your favorite movie? Mm, Saving Private Ryan. Ooh. Favorite book? <laughs> that's, yeah, that's not you're on, a, you're on a deserted island and you can only read one book for the rest of your life over and over again. Hmm. I'm going to say The Winter Sea by Susanna Kearsley. Ooh, I'm going to write that down because I've never read it. It's good. All right. All right. There are a few more questions. Do you have book characters of yours that haunt you? And why do uh, that is? They kind of, yeah, they do kind of stick with you. Um, some of them more than others, perhaps because you relate to some of them more than others. Um, I, one of the biggest fears I have as an author, probably any author has, is that they end up pl plagiarizing themselves over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. So writing the same book over and over again or writing the same character over and over again. So um, to have one character that stays with you more than others uh, is kind of a little bit reassuring in that perhaps they weren't the same character. Yeah, I think it was F. Scott Fitzgerald said that we all have one book. We just keep rewriting we, the one book. Quite possibly. So we'll have to explore that another time. <laughs> uh, I think for the final, there's a, a lovely question that I think will be a nice roundup. And then I think we'll finish on it. And it, what did you want readers to take away from the Paris apartment? I would like readers to take away from the Paris apartment uh, first um, the role that um, women played in this conflict. Um, it's not told often enough. Uh, their stories aren't told often enough, um, whether it be the agents that were sent in, whether it be the women in combat on the Eastern Front that fought for the Red Army, because uh, mm -hmm. there were some pretty extraordinary snipers and uh, fighter pilots. Uh, or even the women that helped um, uh, the escape lines, uh, six, like the Comet line, that sort of thing. Um, they estimate 3,000 women uh, or 3,000 people helped, helped people get across Europe and 70% of those were women. So mm -hmm. their stories just never pop up in history class. So that's the first thing. Um, and the second thing is just the choices that people make or the secrets that people keep, whether on purpose or accidentally and how they affect generations to come. All right. Well, that is a beautiful summary. And if you have not yet read the book, I, I can't recommend it highly enough. I'm not just saying that. I, I honestly, I get a lot of books and I only blurb the ones I can gush about. And I just, I've been gushing about this to everyone. So, and I had, I'd read it before I saw that cover and then the cover came out. And now I'm really, every time I go to a book club, you have to read the Paris apartment. So. <laughs> well, thank you very, very much. It was so wonderful of you to be so kind. Thank you. I enjoyed it very much. John, we've wrapped up. I'm calling our, our bookseller. There he is. I've returned from the shadows. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> the invisible man. <laughs> oh, and I'd just like to uh, close by offering some gratitude of my own at the moment, but first some uh, naked capitalism. I will point out that copies of both the Paris apartment and the Invisible Woman, which I will get correct this time, are available from Allie Robinson Booksellers. Uh, you can visit us in person if you happen to be around. You can give us a call. You can order online. Uh, we also ship both uh, within Winnipeg, uh, nationally and internationally. So feel free to get in touch with us if you would like one of these wonderful books. I'd like to uh, express my thanks one more time uh, for publishing these books in the first place to Forever and Hachette Books Canada in Kelly's case, and of course to Berkeley and uh, Penguin Random House in Erica's case, uh, without which we would have no books to talk about. So thank you very much to the publishers. Also, uh, sincere thanks to all of you for joining us here this evening, for all your uh, questions, your engagement, for spending the evening with us as well. We really do appreciate it, both uh, those who are watching live and those who may be watching this video in the future. Thank you so very much. But I would like to close by offering the most sincere uh, bit of gratitude to, of course, Erica Roebuck for her incredible hosting this evening and for joining us here. And of course, to Kelly Bowen. Thank you so very much. Have a wonderful night, everybody. It's been a real pleasure spending time with you.